for uh, for the folks who are interested in grad school, right? So we had a question about like, you know, how do you pick schools and like, are all schools the same? Um, so theoretically, you can do good research at any school, right? But the, the important thing is you have a good advisor. So you want someone who is active in research, who's actually publishing in like, you know, like um, these conferences. And you want someone who like, you know, cares about their students. So it's, it's sort of like shocking to a lot of people as to like, you know, like, aren't these like basic things? <laughs> it turns out it's not. Um, so uh, it's actually incredibly rare to have advisors who are both sort of like, you know, technically good and actually care about their students. So my advisor was like one such, um, you know, like I had two advisors, but they were sort of like very nice people. And that's really what inspired me to go into academia. But it's not common at all. Like uh, lots of people um, are indifferent to downright abusive towards the students. Um, and academia is structured in a way that like there's a lot of power in the hands of professors and very little power in the hand of graduate students. So like pick your school and your um, advisor sort of like very carefully, like, you know, like talk to their students and like see whether they're doing active research and so on, and then sort of like make the decision. This is really like a long conversation, but like that's the sort of like crux of it. Um, I have a blog post on like how to pick grad schools for research, like if you're interested and I can point you to that. How do you vet advisors? Um, good question. So you talk to their students and um, other students in the same department. Um, and when you talk to the students, the students are not going to be like, you know, like, yeah, my advisor is like terrible, like, you know, very bad. <laughs> no, nobody's going to say that stuff. So um, you have to sort of like read between the lines. So the people who have like good advisors, they are outright enthusiastic about them. And they're very like, you know, like, uh, they're very happy. Uh, it shows. And they're very happy to talk about their advisors and so on. The people who have like terrible advisors, they're not going to say outright they're terrible, but they'll be like, yeah, yeah, life is good. Like, you know, like tamp down enthusiasm and like you have to kind of read between the lines. And if you talk to a lot of their students, you get a very good idea of like, you know, like what culture is at, is at their lab and what working with them is like. So that's what I would recommend you do. Um, working for a few years versus grad school. So again, like, I mean, both paths work. So if you go to um, uh, industry for, if you work for a few years, the advantage is that you have a much more um, uh, realistic sense of like, you know, like what you want to do. Like people who have been in uh, uh, industry for a while, when they come back to grad school, they are like, this is the topic I want to work on. This is the advice I want to work on. I'm going to do it. And they're like very, they get, get through grad school fast, right? Um, if you move from undergrad to grad school, um, that's also a good option. Um, and um, one of the things about um, grad school is that um, you don't get paid a lot of money. Uh, in fact, you don't get paid like a whole lot at all. Um, uh, so I think in some cases, like you make less than unemployment. So it's not an option that you you take for money. Um, one thing people don't actually know is that when you do uh, a PhD uh, in computer science, um, you don't pay the school. Um, the school pays you. So you get a stipend for being a teaching assistant or a research assistant. And basically the whole way through the PhD is like paid for, like you don't pay anything. In computer science, um, what you actually give up is roughly about like half a million dollars. Because if you are off an industry working um, at that time for like a software company, you'd be making like, you know, like $100,000 or $120,000 every year. Here you'd be making like $20,000. So like, if you take five years to um, finish a PhD, you're giving up in sort of like earned income about $500,000 or roughly like a house. <laughs> so, um, so yes, so you don't have to pay anything, but you're also giving up a lot of money that you could be making. That's how to think about it. How do you get into research before or in anticipation of grad school? Um, you take courses like these <laughs> and you come talk to me and like, you know, there's like a bunch of like professors at, um, uh, at our department who are all active in research and very happy to work with undergrads. And you know, like we can get you started in like one of our projects and that's usually the best introduction to research. Um, how should you decide between picking a master's and a PhD? Okay, so, um, so, you should, so the master's really only makes sense in a very few specific cases. 
So for example, let's say that your dream job is to be like, you know, doing graphics in like, you know, like DreamWorks or something like that. And you feel that like you need more sort of like um, uh, knowledge about graphics before you can actually sort of like go into industry and do the job. Uh, then you can do a master's and it sort of like makes sense. But in a master's, you are paying the department, right? And you're paying a lot. Um, a master's degree costs anywhere between like 30 to 60 K dollars. So um, it's, it's very expensive. And in a lot of like different um, scenarios, it doesn't actually make sense because you can get the same job without the master's by simply working in industry at sort of like the right position for like a few years. So you can gain experience and then reapply and then get this other job, right? So, which is much preferable to paying like 60K and, and doing masters. So um, I would say there are very few cases where it makes sense. So sort of like think strongly about it before um, doing a master's degree. Um, so, so to sort of like uh, add a little bit more to that, a PhD is about research. So it's sort of like an apprentice program where you work with a researcher, you learn how to do research, and the goal is at the end of the program, you go out and you do research yourself. So you become a full researcher, basically. For a master's, uh, the idea is that like you are learning more. You're more in, learning more advanced topics than what you did in undergrad. And because it's sort of like, it's not a, like a apprentice program, like it's very expensive, like because you're taking all these advanced courses. And again, like the expense is the major part of it. If, ma if the master's program was free, then I would recommend it to like a lot more people. Uh, but uh, it is very expensive, so you have to sort of think about like whether you know it makes sense for you, and you know where you want to go in life. How plausible or difficult is it to start out in industry and then return to academia after a few years? Yeah, so this is like you know how I was saying that you know like um, uh, grad school doesn't pay anything. Um, it turns out that if you go to industry and you're making like you know 100k a year, it's very hard to go back to eating noodles. <laughs> so this is the major reason why a lot of people who go to industry thinking they'll come back actually never come back. So um, there are people who return, but it's, it's it's kind of rare, right? Because like you are giving up a lot of income and like you may have been used to like a different kind of lifestyle. And now you're sort of like, you know, like um, you're moving back to sort of like a, a lifestyle where like you would have to like, you know, like uh, live within a significantly smaller budget. So, um, so yeah, I mean, like I've, I've seen people do this, but it is rare. So if you go to industry, like most people stay in industry, basically. All right. How do people in industry get the three refs? So um, yeah, good question. So most of them just go back to their um, undergrad um, advisors or professors whose classes they took and they ask for letters. This works best if it's been like a short time since you graduated. So if you graduate in like 2020 and then you ask for a letter in 2025, I will have only a very vague recollection of like who you are <laughs> and what you did. So it's, it's much better to do it like very close to sort of like, you know, when you're taking the class. Um, but people have come back and asked for letters and like, you know, like it, it works, but it's most effective when done close to when you graduate. How is working industry different after say a PhD versus a bachelor's? Yes. So good question. So um, so uh, th there are different um, career paths you can take after getting a PhD and only very few of them will actually use the knowledge that you gained during the PhD. So typically people hire PhDs because PhDs are very good at working with uncertain knowledge. So when you do undergrad and like, you know, like, let's say you get a job at Amazon after that, right? Usually when you are like, you know, level one or level two engineer, what you have to do is very concrete and very um, defined for you. It's like build this allocator, like this is what it should do, this is the performance it should get. Fine, like we can do that. But as you sort of like move up through industry, um, things become much more fluid. And it's like very unclear as to like, you know, like what problem to tackle, how to best tackle it, how to evaluate different competing ap approaches and so on. These are things that a PhD is really good at um, because like, you know, they would have done it during their PhD. Like they, they pick their problems, they evaluate solutions and so on and so forth. So they're very comfortable with uncertainty. 
And that is really what you want as you sort of like move up the ladder in industry. That's a skill that PhDs are you know, traditionally hired for. Very rarely are they like, you know, like, hey, you did your PhD in compilers, like build compilers for us. Usually it's been like, you did a CS PhD, let's do something else in CS, roughly. Yeah. Um, let's see, so, uh, let's see. How is working in industry? So we, we answered that. Um, is it acceptable to get a, a rec letter and then hold on to it if you work for two years, as opposed to asking for a rec letters years later? It's a good question. Um, I haven't actually seen people do that. I mean, I think you'd have to talk to your professor and tell them this is what you're planning to do. Um, and then, you know, like, uh, uh, it'll be fine, I think. Um, so the thing is, like, uh, when you get a rec letter, like, the professor has to submit it for you. Like, you can't submit it. Like, it's not like you actually get the letter and you hold on to it and then you submit it whenever you want. The request goes to the professor and the professor has to do that action for you. So. In the thing that you're planning, I think the professor would write the letter like when you're taking the class or when you graduate and then just hold on to that in their working directory and then like they submit later, right? So it, it can be done. I've not done this so far, but it can be done and you want to talk to the professor to sort of like work it out with them. What are the worst reasons to attempt a PhD? Um, there's lots and you know we are running out of time, but like the number one reason I've seen is to basically um, to learn stuff. Like somebody's like really interested in a topic and they want to learn something and they get a PhD for that. And this seems like a good reason, right? I mean, a PhD does allow you a lot of time to get into like depth in for a particular topic. But research and learning something are very different, right? Um, uh, you can learn uh, in industry sort of like um, on your off time, right? Doing research is much more intensive and uh, you can be great at learning and you can suck at research. So these two are not sort of like interchangeable. So when you're doing PhD, the mental model should be, I am training to be a researcher. Uh, not that I'm trying to learn more about a particular topic. Um, okay, so how does the online masters that UTCS offers compare to doing an in-person masters? At this point of time, I think they're the same <laughs> because they're all going to be like online and everything. But usually like when you do an in-person masters, you get a lot more face time with professors. It's more in depth. The relationship is different and so on. So um, the online masters is significantly cheaper. I think like 4X cheaper. So um, if you just want a degree for some reason, I think that is what I would recommend. Um, but um, assuming, you know, like you have a life goal where it makes sense to get a master's, in-person master's would be definitely better. Um, okay. If you do end up working in your field in industry after your PhD, how does industry research differ from academia? So, um, this will basically be the last question I answered today because we do have to wrap up. But uh, we can talk more like this on next class also. But the sort of the main difference is uh, students. So this is why I am in academia versus um, industry. Um, like if you love working with students, you get that in academia, you can mentor students, you can see them develop, you can teach courses, like you know, like it's, it's very fun teaching a course like this. In industry, you do the research, um, but it's more um, working with other industry researchers and like product teams and so on. So it's a different kind of thing. And it's like a personal preference as to like what you prefer. Like do you wanna work with students or do you wanna work with like product teams? And based on that, you decide basically where you want to go.